Got it. Yes. Nice office. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's humble. It works. <laughs> oh, Which is man, good beautiful guitar there. Holy cow. Man. The white ones. Those are nice. The white one's a 12 string. Oh, really? Yeah. Sure enough. It's quite oh, horrible that's... close up here. Let me show you. <laughs> it's got this gold trim. It's like some mm -hmm. weird Elvis thing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you for this. No, it's my pleasure. Are you are you more popular now since podcasting has come about than you ever were before? <laughs> I you know I don't I don't know. I was thinking about interviews I'd done in the past and like weird things that popped up. I don't it's, it's six of one, I would say. Let me do I, let me do an intro just in case we miss anything. Sounds um, good. Welcome to a new episode of Starfish and Coffee. Um, my guest today is Shannon Wheeler. And if you don't know who he is, you should probably be ashamed. His um biggest claim to the uh the magical ring of superstardom is no doubt the comic strip too much coffee man but he has done other things and we will discuss promise oh we'll try you'll be pleased to know i've come to this interview with absolutely no preparation can we start at the beginning ish because looking at your work there is no way that your influences aren't the same as mine which is um Mad Magazine, mm -hmm. Robert Crumb, and yeah. Gilbert Shelton. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a pretty a pretty decent stab in the dark? Yeah, I didn't I didn't come across Crumb until college about, but Basil Wolverton, which I guess is Mad Magazine, and I think Crumb took a lot from from Wolverton, uh, but that that hit me i i just loved his stuff uh when i was a kid and and definitely gilbert um the, growing up that i i was a big fan of garfield as a kid and then i stumbled on the fat freddy's cat and it was just it it blew my mind the the predictability of garfield is what i loved and then you'd turn a page in fat Freddy cat and just, it would just go left turn. And it, it was just like taking acid for the first time. All of a sudden everything's connected and the universe is one. And yeah, it opened me up in a way. I was like, Oh, this is what good cartooning is. I think that was no mad was definitely my, my first intro to, to the, to how bizarre comics could get. Yeah. But, when I discovered the Freak Brothers, again, like you say, it tipped it on its even more on its head. It was like, wow, yeah. you can you can really do this. And <laughs> I don't know. I guess I guess no, nobody was making any money, or maybe they were. But when how old was I? So I'd have been I don't know, fifteen, sixteen. You just imagine that somebody has made a success out of something bizarre i don't know maybe he didn't make any money at all that wouldn't be a surprise either they were selling you know a hundred thousand copies for an okay underground maybe comic. maybe he did so they you know they they made a living you know rent was 50 bucks um i don't know i've never yeah have you have, you have you ever met um yeah that was the weird thing is that i i moved to texas um and I was staying with my aunt and uncle and I had a girlfriend in France and I was going to France to visit her. And my uncle said, Oh, you know, can you take these photos and, and things? He, he, he had done a uh, run a music venue called the Vulcan gas company. And I, Oh, sure. So I, you know, he goes, Oh, take it to my friend Gilbert. I was like, Oh, okay. 
and I'm like, wait, Gilbert, Gilbert Shelton? And he's like, yeah, yeah, he's an old friend of mine, except he speaks in a heavy Texas accent. I had no idea, but that then explains why growing up, we had a bunch of uh, Fat Freddy Cat comics and Freak Brother comics. Like, then, yeah, I went and visited him in, uh, in, in Paris and brought him a bunch of stuff and we hung out and had coffee and it was great it was a super nice guy and it was was, yeah it was a mind blower everybody from everyone seems to end up in paris sooner or later is it just (laughs) well jim went i'll do that and see what all the fuss was about i you know part of it i think is that they had a genuine love and respect for some of these guys and the the effort that they put in like jazz or something it has that and yeah you go right. where you're loved you know it's funny isn't it how, how how we've had to come this far in time to figure it out <laughs> it, it, it used to be just it was just stuff once upon a time and and i think now well pe- people like me anyway i i really i really miss it the way the way you could discover something mm. no one ever pushed a fat freddy's cat comic on you it was something you found by yeah. by weird means in a in a store or a, some friend's older brother or yeah in the basement on the floor yeah. Yeah, and you don't get that anymore <laughs> but yeah i yeah that's true there's there's a little bit of a word of mouth where there's some music where a friend turns me on to it or a cartoonist that a friend likes. Um, there's a little bit of word of mouth, but th- yeah, it, it's not the same kind of mind blowing moment. Yeah, shame. So you knew this was coming. We're going to have to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Too, much, too much coffee, man. I don't want to make you tell the whole story again, but the <laughs> but the story's the story, right? Um, yeah. How? Well, not how did it come about, but you, you were drawing comics before you did that. You were drawing strips before it wasn't some kind of overnight success thing. Right. Yeah. No, I'd done a lot of zines and done, I was doing a strip at the the Daily Californian, which is a college paper, is uh, I was doing a strip there and then I moved to Texas and I was doing a strip in the um, Daily Texan. Um, and Oddly enough, like the people I was cartooning with, um, you know, they were, it, uh, who was it? It was uh, Robert Rodriguez, who's now the filmmaker, um, uh, Acme Comic Library, Chris Ware. Um, but everybody there was just an amazing artist. So I really had to up my game. But my comic was kind of unremarkable in the, in the lineup. And so I thought, oh, I need to do, I need to do something that's iconic. And that's where it was just a visual pun where I I wanted a visual handle on a character. And I was trying to think of something like Clyben who did the cartoon cat. I I was trying to think what would be something that would appeal to people. And so I did the coffee. It it was a gag. I mean, and I did it as a one-off, but somehow it found a voice inside me and, and, I was like, oh, this is intellectual curiosity, but kind of a stupid intellectual who has an innocence and a um, kind of unbridled id, um, neurotic. And yeah, it just, it, it resonated. It just hit something that I didn't expect. It's massively, massively intelligent. I'll give you that. I mean, you, <laughs> might, you might not have meant it to be, but... <laughs> I, I was laughing. I, I picked up um there's a little strip and it's nothing. The guy, it's not part of the um you know the section where the guy splits up with his girlfriend, which is presumably you, and he's going out for coffee with, with a friend of his who's a girl, and he's been right. dumped and he decides to try and get back, and there's a little square where he says something, he goes around, he knocks on the door and he, he says something like, I need your help. 
And she says, I'll be ready in five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Just little tiny little things crease me up about the, the level of observation or things that you've just gone yeah that, that was quite funny <laughs> a, a lot of that was uh, yeah it's just it's it's free form it is jazz where i am writing something and then i just say oh this is boring and then you know i've drawn the page and then i just i want that note to hit c sharp rather than a b flat or something you know it's like yeah that now it's funny and it kind of zings in a but that's pulling from Freak Brothers, where all of a sudden you turn the page and there's six cats and it, there isn't one Fat Freddy cat that they've been taking turns to feed. The, it's just, I want that surprise and I want to give myself that freedom. Um, you, are you able to think as as the audience at that point or do you just bore yourself? Uh, or can you disassociate yourself to go, okay, I'm seeing this for the first time. What do I think? Yeah, sometimes when it is something that I really like, it I start laughing at my own joke, which is sort of pathetic. But uh, when it's, oh, this is against the rules. I can't do this because, and then I think, what rules? And then, I, and that's when I, I, I really, that's my favorite part. I mean, I only hit that rarely, but. I did the uh, Too Much Coffee Man shirt and I was trying to think of what makes a good t-shirt and all my friends or, you know, people that made graphics work were, were incorporating the kanji, Japanese lettering in. And I thought that was sort of tacky to appropriate another culture into a, into a t-shirt. Um, just use lettering to make your crap look good. And I thought, well, I could justify it if I was selling it in Japan. And I thought, well, how would I license to someone in Japan? And then I thought, you know, all I need to do is pretend that it got bootlegged and then bootleg it back. And I don't actually have to do any of this. I just have to say that this is what happened. And then all of a sudden, and, and I was like, oh, I can't do that. That's against the rules. I was like, no, that's that's funny. Like, And so I did a <laughs> bootleg of a bootleg, but the whole thing was fiction. Um, and you say and that's thousands on postage. <laughs> yeah, a lot of hassle and trying to invoice somebody and um, dealing with other people. But it's it's a narrative then, and it's and it it's commentary, and it's uh, I don't know. That's that's when I really like it is when it is violating a rule that I didn't even know I was following. But right back at the beginning, see, this is what I liked about about that stuff back in. 1987 i for some reason probably the same reason as you decided i was going to start a rock and roll fanzine i had no idea so you go yeah. through that that whole thing of uh, okay well I'll, I'll write some stuff and i'll make i made some um a4 backgrounds um i borrowed some spider-man comics off a friend and i didn't <laughs> I, I didn't think he'd need them anymore so i just cut them up <laughs> Um, stuff I love it. On, and you kind of fold it, and then this this will ring for you. And then you kind of go, okay, I've made one. Now I need to get them all copied. Well, that's quite time consuming. Back end of the eighties, it was um, probably quite expensive as well. So I made friends with a a girl who worked in the Canon shop. <laughs> you know, you get yeah, the hair, whatever. Can yeah, you, can you can you duplicate this how many times um 300 mm -hmm. oh, yeah okay so then you go home with a big stack like this and you get home and you haven't got a stapler that can right. fit across an a5 width right it's yeah. the whole the whole thing is living by your wits and, and and that discovery is really what makes i think uh what's the word it's the genesis of when you start like that you just carry on like that you don't need anyone yeah. And I'm guessing that's your story too, yeah? Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly right. I mean, when I did the first Too Much Coffee Man, I did it as a zine and I photocopied it. And either you lie how many copies it was, uh, and oh, 10 copies and you've made 300 or or you make friends with somebody and then they'll make copies for you. 
because they have a job. <laughs> they have the job, right? But it's they're getting paid five bucks an hour or something. They're getting paid nothing, so they don't care. I, they'd rather help an artist, somebody that wants to be an artist, and have fun than make money for their boss who's <laughs> exploiting them. So, yeah, that was that. I there was a big revolution in zines at that time because of the new technology of photocopy machines. All of a sudden, we all had a Gutenberg press, yeah, down the street. And it was uh, cheap. I haven't seen I mean, a copy in a store for years. Have you? <laughs> yeah, no, they're they're and and they've tightened up all the security. So you go in and you try to you know, bring your zip drive and print out your PDF and it's, yeah, <laughs> and you've left change. Them. I mean, and you've left Tipex all over the <laughs> all over the glass in the photocopy. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I. I've started, I just finished putting together a book of my early stuff. So the early comic books. So I, I, it's fresh in my memory, all the weird, silly things that I was doing at the time uh, just to get a comic book done. And I want to, next I'm going to collect the zines into a book and then I'll collect the single page cartoons into a book. So I, I just want to kind of, create a library of of my work and then close that chapter and move on to the next um thing but yeah it, it is it there was an energy of that time where it was how do i do this and you just fake it i really learn yeah. it fake it just just talking about your work let me pull something up here how how long i mean there's a lot of work goes into this this isn't this isn't scratchy comic book work, is it? There's a lot of there's a lot of hours in here. I mean, I know how long it takes to black out a panel. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually yeah. work. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it was you know a, a page a day. You know that that was four or five hours, um, and then figuring out how do I letter, you know, how much space between the lines, and then talking to friends how do you do it and figuring this out and just is it all caps do you have upper and lower case it, everything was an experiment and then kind of trial and error what looks good what looks bad i did so many bad comics <laughs> but, but that's how you get where you're going right that's how you get there yeah yeah um, yeah Back in those early days, I also I did a quick scan of stuff just to see if there's anything else I could pick out about you. And do I recall your one of your landlords was the leader of the Black Panthers? Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually I'm just starting to work on some of those stories now. Uh, yeah, Huey Newton was my landlord. Um, I'd moved into a house and uh, living with some friends and we were renting this place. What, what year is this? That was 85, 86, right in there. Okay. Um, and we had no idea. I, I had no idea. I didn't know. I, it was down in Berkeley, which is right next to Oakland. And yeah, Frederica Newton is, it was the name on the, on the lease. That was his wife. And she'd come by and, and, I was telling my stepdad, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, this beautiful woman, you know, she, she'll come up and knock on the door, Frederica Newton. And, you know, we are late on rent or something like that. He's like, Frederica Newton. Why is that familiar? I go, yeah, yeah. Her husband or boyfriend or something. He's, he's in this Lincoln continental, you know, parked kind of the <laughs> wrong way, he leaves it idling. And, and he's just like a big pissed off black guy. And, and my, my dad's like, stepdad he, he's like frederica newton that's not her husband isn't huey newton i was like yeah yeah that's her husband and he's like do you know who that is i was like no he goes huey newton the leader of the black pit i was like well, yes yeah. so he goes like pay your rent on time <laughs> that's what he said <laughs> just pay your rent on time <laughs> you know we didn't really have many yeah, we dealt with Frederica. She was she was nice, but I don't know. It was just it's just a very surreal moment in history. Um, 
that 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 he's a landlord with these stupid 19 year olds renting to college students uh, just getting in rent disputes because just the, hilarious the, the black panthers wear what okay. there are a number of different things i mean it, in the 60s there's so many stories about the black panthers um they you know they were a militant uh black organization and they did a lot of like they had a free lunch program they were very much about empowerment and and fighting for civil liberties and equal rights so they did a lot of really good things culturally and then they also did some crazy stuff where you know they would intimidate a jury one of them would kill a police officer and then or at least be accused of it and then they would intimidate the jury to get to get off the um um, one of them who I ended up meeting this guy, um, Brent, uh, William Brent, Bill Brent. Um, I went to Cuba later and met him. He actually hijacked an airplane and took it to Cuba. And he's like, <laughs> it's just like, I odd, I, you know, I'm not radical, but somehow, you know, Berkeley and then living in Austin and these hippie parents, like, only in retrospect, I go, wow, this is really weird, these little connections. Uh, like so that's what I want to write about. Orbit. Yeah. <laughs> My mom's even more that way. Like she saw Elvis when she was a kid at her high school. Uh, when I was growing up, she took us to see Jim Jones, who later, you know, he's a cult leader who created a mass suicide. Yeah, I have memories of seeing Jim Jones and not that we followed him. Yeah, just this odd, you know, like when she gets a sense scene, of was it was he kind of like um like a TV evangelist without the TV? Yes, but it was not a giant stadium. It was a church. We drove up to Sacramento and you know, maybe 300, 400 people or something in a room. And... That's a lot of people for a cult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a very powerful political figure and had a movement um, and then at some point just got more and more paranoid, moved to Guyana and then did a mass suicide. But I have memories of, of the people around me and, the, and hearing him and my mom's like, oh yeah, we just went and saw him a couple times. <laughs> like, yeah, this, is, this is weird, you know how weird this is. It's just just once out of interest and twice just to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Could have been a good thing. Could have been a good thing. So, yeah, he had some good things to say. I was like, All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked at some pictures of him online. He looks the gentleman, as cult yeah. leaders do, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And she said even then he was saying that the CIA was going to kill him. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I just remember. Uh, the other kids playing with them. And the, the weird thing is like, just thinking, wow, a lot of these people end up dying horribly. Like these memories I have of these people, they all, most of them probably ended up dying or a lot of them. And that's, that's a, that's an odd memory. I, we weren't tempted to join the cult or anything. That's not, um, you know, we weren't, it wasn't yeah, like yeah. we dodged a bullet, but yeah, you know, she was just curious about things that were happening. But your your dad started a commune. Yeah, in the early '60s, he bought a piece of land in Northern California and then um, opened it up. It's called a free land policy, and so anybody that wanted to could come and live there for free. Um, and and that ran. And then in the early '70s, it it was condemned and the Ronald Reagan actually was governor and he sent in the national guard and they bulldozed down the houses and shut down the land. Um, and, and so that's when the commune ended, but then he opened it up again to a few people. So there's about you know, a dozen, two dozen people that were living up there when I, I went and lived there for a little bit. So you're well. definitely a child of hippies. Yes. <laughs> well that goes that could go a fair way to explaining kind of where you went with it 
tell me i mean we've touched on it a little bit i i, I just i'd like to get into the self publishing thing was it, it well it wasn't called self publishing at one point was it you were just doing what you had to do to get your yeah thing it was just indie publishing in the real yeah. world underground indie and um living in texas i was doing some newspaper comics you know college paper stuff and then um a friend of mine moved into a house and there was a printing press in there and we just thought oh let's do a comic book um oh handy yeah hey look <laughs> I mean, it was a little <laughs> tiny one sheet you know sheet fed thing and yeah. then by the time it took us about a year to finally get the comic hit, and i guess the the printer who had lived there before him still owed money on it. And so just as we were going to try to figure out how to print the comic ourselves, um, uh, repo men came and took the press away. <laughs> so, uh, well, we let's just find somebody to print this for us. And that's when we did uh, our jab number one, which is uh, just, you know, a silly anthology book. Yeah. <clears throat> but at some point, uh, I would assume you went legit. You, you I, must have gathered enough momentum and gone, you know what? I've, I've got somewhere or I've got to a point where I can say, I do this and you can tax me for it. Yeah. Yeah. That was, so the third issue of jab that we were putting out, we needed to sales were declining. Second issue typically they they go down and then third issue we're like we need to do something to make this sell again and comics at the time were doing these gimmicks and we just wanted to do a gimmick you know we wanted to that would that would help us sell but all of us hated the idea of you know like a, a foil or a hologram it just was stupid um and, and so this is where the yeah, and expensive. Yeah, yeah. To, to a hologram, you're going to print 3,000 issues and it would add 50 cents a book, um, which is your profit margin. Yeah. And so it was actually one of the buddies, you know, this guy that is just a, a another hippie child. Um, he's like, oh, let's just shoot it with a gun. And it was like, yeah. And, you know, it's a small enough group. There's four of us and we drink. You know, so we're, you know, we're like, yeah, let's shoot it with a gun. So we just, um, and then even in a small group, immediately there's the naysayers of, oh, we can't do that. Uh, you know, how are we going to aim it? How do we, it's going to look damaged. The re retailers will return it. Uh, but how is, many, you know. So this is all the comics that you're shooting. Yes. Right. No, it's not a master. And then it's printed with a hole. It's all of the comics. We shot. Uh, well, yeah, I just, I, you know, take out a napkin and say, okay, how many comics can it go through? It can go through about 10 or 15. <laughs> We're going to print 5,000 books. So how many bullets is that? It's a few hundred bullets. A box of bullets is 20 bucks. Okay. This is a $20 gimmick, right? Yeah. This is what it, <laughs> maybe 30 bucks. Uh, and so yeah, we did the napkin math. We take some comics in the backyard and it's a 22. So it's, you know, it Texas too. So like, and we try it out and like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I had a neighbor that actually shot squirrels in the morning and would uh, eat them. Like that's <laughs> the Texas <laughs> neighbor. <laughs> Again, in retrospect, you're like, oh, this was kind of weird, you know, but at the time it was like, yeah, you know, whatever. Like, let's, play with gun, you know, drink our beer and take our rifles out in the backyard and shoot calm. Just, it, it, yeah, it's redneck and stupid. But yeah, we saw, okay, we can put it in a stack and shoot them. And then, so we print the comics in San Antonio, drive them up and then um, have a big party with guns and beer and shoot comics for a couple of days. But so, so the whole didn't have to be in the same place. You didn't draw around. There wasn't any intention. Yeah, we drew, we, we told everybody, we figured out, yes, if you, if you line up your comic and then um, have a spot, then yeah, it, it's just dead center is what we said. Right. And yeah. so every story, then we told people to accommodate the bullet hole. So for my story, it was too much coffee, man, 
being surrounded by police and they're shooting into his house. So the window breaks, his mug breaks. Like <laughs> I, I just use the bullet hole uh, a lot to, to tell the story that way. Um, yeah, so every story then meant to be, some of the cartoonists were like, oh, there's a bullet hole, I'll just avoid the space. And that was kind of lame. What? But for the most part, it was like worked into the story. How could you work around it? That's just, that's not real. <laughs> why, why would you not incorporate the hole? I, I don't know, because people just did, couldn't wrap their brains around the fact that we would actually shoot a comic. Like it is, it is so, we called it the stupidest gimmick ever. Like, But it's the it's, best idea of all time. Imagine I thought doing so. it now. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen King loading up a, I don't know, a sniper rifle and taking pot shots at <laughs> hardbacks. They and, go for thousands. We, we sold, we had the 22s, um, which sold cover price. And then, and then we had a 36 and a nine millimeter <laughs> and a 45. And, and then we charged more for the bigger uh, holes. <laughs> and then we had a, um, we had an issue that was the shotgun issue um, that came poly bagged. Because that people were just starting to, you know, put comics into poly bags and stuff, and so and it was guaranteed unreadable, which was yeah, it was nice because it's like we did a gimmick, it was um, stupid, it was cheap, it was funny, and it made fun of other gimmicks, but it it kind of did all those things at, at once. We said it was the only comic in history whose value went up as the condition went down. <laughs> Because our idea was, you know, hey, these comics are meant to be read. They're not meant to be collected. And <laughs> it was, uh, but that press then got me sort of this national, like uh, Wizard Magazine and other places would talk about the bullet hole. And that's where I was able to launch the first issue of Too Much Coffee. I mean, it was on that, um, it was on the basis of that comic. Oh, yeah. We were talking about going legit, weren't we? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if that's legit, but you know. And then the funny thing is, like, so we had the well, le party legit we in the sense that you don't need another job, or you can get right. you, know, you can get by doing what you love, which is a huge turning point. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah, that that's where I was able to quit. Uh, I was working at a video store, and and I realized I'm like, okay, I used to own a video shop. Oh, nice. What an what an education that is to to <laughs> it really That's is a whole like other a, story. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Those are good days. VHS tapes. Please rewind. Please rewind. No one ever did. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um uh, see see that that's the whole I, I see where you're as we chat, I see you know, you got the mad thing, you got the video store. And I think some of us just live in just live in popular culture and you sponge it up. Yeah. It's just, it's just just the way some of us are, I think. You just you just sponge it all and recycle it into something else. It was it was fun. I mean, like that's looking back at the again, I just did not appreciate it. which now it's writing some of these stories and and that's why I want to create this library of old work refamiliarize myself with it remember the love and the fun of it and then um I'm, for dark horse i'm working on one that collects my college cartoons which are pretty terrible but then i want to have uh stories that that contextualize them to say here's you know here's a little bit of a um, autobiographical anecdote and then here's the strips that i did at the time so like um, you did with um what's it called is it called the originals the collected book you just not long put out of coffee man yeah so that that'll yeah that's the too much coffee man one through nine um, yeah and, it, and, and each one is prefaced by where you were at the time yeah yeah and then i think that brilliant mad like disclaimer of coincidences <laughs> which i love <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Gaines. i mean he was such a rule breaker and decided to have fun with mad magazine and 
as a kid, it would always blow my mind. Like, how could he be selling something and be so self-effacing and have it be so good? And like, I remember Mad Mad lowers its price. And I was like, this is 35 cents. This is the same, like, I don't understand. <laughs> and then I realized that they had just lowered it on the page. And I'm like, what assholes? Like, how could <laughs> this is just. This is why I thought it was a huge influence on you because there's not many comics where Mad, and I only know this in hindsight, I didn't never figured it out at the time, was really self aware. It knew yeah. it was a comic. And I find that with Too Much Coffee Man in that I, th- I perceive that he knows he's in a comic in some way. <laughs> he's, he's, he's very aware that, you know, it's not like Batman. Where you read a story, and right. you go, "Wow, that was great!" It's 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 different. It's um, it's like psychological cartooning. I, I you know, I I oddly, there's not a lot of coffee humor in it. And anybody that oh, the, you know, you need to do these coffee jokes. Yeah, there's like three coffee jokes. You know, it's too strong. It's too weak. It's <laughs> too expensive. I don't, you know, like it. And going into it, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this Too Much Coffee Man book, and it's going to sell comics, but I need to make this entertaining for myself. I need to make myself laugh. And that's that's what I, that's that's when I had the f- fun with, like the same way we shot the comic. It's like, that was fun. And yeah, very much. It's like, and we'll gain, like those Mad Magazines, you know, lowering the price he must have had that thought of or people say oh you can't do that it's going to piss off kids or people think that you lowered the price but you didn't you know like but he did that and and yeah it infuriated me but it was so funny um it's, so when, when it, it's funny it's kind of allowed isn't it okay i get it because <laughs> you're, so. you're part of a community almost of people who get the joke. And I, I think it, I never felt talked down to by mad magazine. It, yeah. it was very much like, Hey, we're going to make these jokes and you need to step up to where and where we are. And, and, um, and we're a little bit, we're a little bit of jerks. Um, but it's, yeah, it is. It's, it's an education. And they're saying, at least, you know, there's no deception in what, they're saying, hey, let's pull the curtain down um, that people selling you Coke, those are the real jerks. And they're telling you that they're going to, they're promising you happiness with an automobile or a life changer by smoking cigarettes or something. And Mad said, no, these are, these people are genuine liars. Like, we're going to tell you that we're liars and, and teach you um, how to be cynical. Yeah, I right. feel like I feel like you did some of that, except about being human. It, it's just a book, <laughs> just a comic, a funny comic book about being human, really. Well, thank you. That's I, I love it. I've I've always loved it. And it was I was it, kind of sitting around going, "Who's Shannon? I wonder if he would. I wonder if he would. Yeah, you know, <laughs> maybe he's not doing anything today." No, I just you know, it's just drawing comics and trying to you know get through the next uh, the next chapter and and uh, yeah, just figure out what's going to be entertaining for me. Like, how do I how do I revisit this old material in, in a way that is still engaging for Did myself? You stay away from politics on purpose. Did, did you ever uh, want to do politics, but just went nah, no? No, I mean, I I did do um, some some of the stuff like I like in Too Much Coffee Man. He ends up in the future. Everybody's in jail um, because everybody's housed, clothed, and fed because where everything is illegal. So anything you do is illegal. So everybody's in jail, um, and that was a little bit of the social politics. And then I guess when Trump got elected, I did um, a book where I took his tweets and I illustrated them. And it was shit my president says. And that's when I did a lot of 
political stuff, but it's so, and then, and then I did a, a graphic novel version of the Mueller report. Cause I thought this is the scandal of the century, you know, like this is, so I got into it. Um, but then the Mueller report ended up being, you know, just a stepping stone. Like that was the first step of scandal. Like it just got worse and worse. So it didn't sell very well. It, the, the, I like doing politics and every now and again, I think it's really important to, to step in and do it. And I think that there are politics inside the work that I'm doing, um, but when it goes overt, then it becomes very temporal. Like the Mueller report now is almost impossible to sell because it's just, it's January 6th um, was <clears throat> so much more explicit yeah. than that. What's next? Um, Trump gets in again. I, yeah. Oh man. That's, um, and every time I predict something I'm, I'm wrong. So I hate to, you know, predict anything with, I thought the internet was going to be a fad. I, I thought for sure this was a <laughs> CB radio. I was, uh, you know, and I, I was in Austin and there was a tech industry explosion. I, you know, I, I was putting my cartoons on the web in 93, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be about right. Yeah. And, you know, so I was there in the middle of it and the center and that, and I was like, yeah, it's a fad. Like, <laughs> it's not dial right. up, you know, it's too slow to load. You got to crunch the cartoons down to, I yeah, don't what, know. Um, what did you, um, sorry, just sticking with the politics for a sec. What did you, yeah. Did you, did you, I'm sure you couldn't avoid it. Did you catch the, uh, what they called? The Charlie Hebdo story yes. in, in Paris. I think they're in Holy Paris. Holy cow. Are you kidding? That was, um, yeah, that was, that was really for cartoonists in my friends group. That, I don't want to say it's polarizing, but. You but know, it's some kind of like, like oh. wow, it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, those guys are brave to a level that that to me is um you know i bow down to them i mean like that's uh, yeah. some of the humor i thought was really juvenile and kind of mean and and uh you know but the bravery i mean like that that they would and and then there's people like uh dunesbury um Gary Trudeau, who's, and he said, hey, you kick a hornet's nest and they're going to, he's like, you need to play it safer with your comics. And I don't, that's where a lot of the cartoons were like, hey, we need to be safer with what we're saying and doing. And I, I just thought, no, we need to um, make these people heroes, like what they did. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I do believe that there should be a free speech. And I, I hate that term has kind of become a, mixed bag but I, I think people should say and do in comics I mean this is comics it's fiction it's it's I, th I think that we are allowed free speech in comics and we should applaud it and the bravery of that yeah that That's was incredible strange to I mean I don't think it was the first time they'd done it either I think they were quite persistent of Bender's <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah, half their buddies get killed by these lunatics, and then they put out another issue and they do it again. I mean, like they're as like, wow, that is. Well, I I found that to be. I mean, I can see France from my house. Um, yeah, just just over there. But that that's that's the French for you. Like, oh, I, we'll do it again. I, yeah, I guess they fought Nazis. So like, this is compared to that, you know. Yeah, a crazy story. I I thought it would happen again, to be honest. But yeah, I guess yeah. we don't. Yeah. We don't have we don't have a gun culture in this country at all. Um, I not to blame capitalism, but I, it's it's capitalism. It's we've got uh yeah, it's it's gun industry made a lot of money, and they and they shifted our culture. That's that's one thing that. I want to look at in the next book that I'm doing is how culture is shifted and like NRA pushed it. They created this kind of gun fetish and gun culture 
um, which obviously we're paying for now in a really horrific way, but they, they changed our culture. But the Black Panthers, they saw our culture in a certain way and they wanted it to be different. And they tried to do that. Um, and the, the stories that they have, like the open carry, like, you know, these militant black guys, like, okay, we have rights to carry guns. So they would carry guns. And, and then all of a sudden the laws get changed to not allow that. But there's some of that Mad Magazine energy. I think Bill Gaines changed the culture by saying, hey, don't trust these corporations. Don't trust the... Uh, you know, that what you're being told is, is BS a lot of times. And then Jim Jones tried to do it. He went crazy. And, you know, my dad was trying to do it with a lot of the hippies to change the culture. So, and I see that now too, is like, let's have woke culture. That was an effort to change it, to say, you know, very much like the sixties of like, Hey, be nice to each other. There's injustices that we need to fight. And then there's the counter push to change like, oh, woke culture is, you know, Florida is where woke goes to die. So there's these fights over what our culture will be. Um, and I, that's what I want to talk about a little bit, going back to the 60s and what I saw firsthand, um, yeah. some of those efforts and where, where it went, you know. I mean, it's kind of hard to, I, heard, I, I saw something the other day that said, um, you know, there is no counterculture anymore. And and there's not. Every time there's the sniff of a counterculture, it's gobbled up. There are 400 websites about it, and everyone's a sudden expert, and it's dead. Yeah, and maybe there's just an acceleration. I think that's been the case. Hippies complained about that, and, and you know, Bob Dylan songs are used to sell Cadillacs, hmm. you know, by the 70s or 80s, I guess. Um, so that's, yeah, counterculture becomes culture very quickly and, and it gets exploited. And even within itself, there's people that are exploiting and taking advantage of situations. I guess we've um, just reached that critical mass now where, you know, what it, in the 60s for Bob to sell a Cadillac, it was years and then it yeah. became months and now it's what, hours? <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes i don't know yeah it seems that way but blurring flash character but also remember we're old so now like a month to us is nothing like i i wake up and a year's gone by um back then you know a week took forever so uh, perspective has shifted yeah i mean i've got it does feel that way for sure like i've got notebooks here with things and i I don't usually date things, but I found them. But I'm like, 2018? <laughs> Five years ago, and I still haven't started that project. That was yesterday, yeah. Is that your life too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's life now? Well, what's the typical life now? week, week, month, day for you at the moment? Uh, well, COVID was a weird pluses and minuses i, it I, sure I, was. I hated you know it was i love you know, i said i i, I, I did too in a lot of ways. I, I get invited to a party oh i can't go yeah, where's all the people it. yeah walking around at night um yeah yeah no cars i liked it when it was there were no cars uh yeah so kind of trying to rebound from that um and try to figure out, okay, what do I want to do and not want to do after COVID and trying to remember, Hey, what are the things I liked about it and hold on to those. So now I'm trying to get back into drawing it. It's, it's hard because I'm trying to revisit the old stuff. I did the Kickstarter collecting the old too much coffee, man. And then I'm going to go through the next little bit and collect those so making a nice library of, of material, old material in a way that I feel good about and revisiting stuff. It's, it's tricky because I have to kind of re-experience it. And, you know, there's a lot of sadness and, and um, you know, you look at 
your old life. And it's like, wow, like what you didn't appreciate, what was magical, um, what's gone that you should have held on to, what's still around that, yeah, I, I looked at those old comics like, oh, this is better than I thought it was. Like I, I did some pretty good comics. I, I should have some good feelings about it. But, but it's a roller coaster of emotions and to allow, it's exhausting to revisit old material. Really? You're really that yeah. emotionally attached to it? Yeah. It's that's nice. It's oh, that's good. It it it's a diary. I mean, like I read that old stuff and I can remember drawing it. Like well, I mean, when it was good, like there was electricity of of drawing something, and yeah, I remember like there was a a I guess it was around too much coffee man three. I dated the girl across the street and then we broke up. <laughs> She's Rocky Erickson's uh, stepdaughter, actually. So we broke up and then I started watching her date other people. And I'm, so I'm drawing this whole comic book and I could see out my window her dating and it was just hell. <laughs> but going back through the old comics, like I remember that vividly and just feeling like this better be worth it. You know, the effort and work, <laughs> you know, like watching her leave at eight or nine o'clock, get picked up and then be driven home. And then some guy goes in and the light goes on in the bedroom, the light goes off in the bedroom. And then you know, 30 minutes later, the light goes on downstairs and then he leaves. It's like, man, this is just, this is this is hell. Like but I this am is, saying, this is the comic book I just read yesterday when I was catching back up. I'm like, well, wow, <laughs> you just you just told me the story of the thing I read yesterday. <laughs> but I relive it to collect it. You know, like I re, re it's it's I don't know some of those memories. I was like, wow, I I really put this away and and uh, compartmentalized it until I reread those pages. And it's like, wow, I I. I feel this. But it's funny, isn't it? How how yesterday or like yesterday that's 30 years ago is is like five minutes ago as well. Yeah. It, you, you can you can reach back over your shoulder and you can touch it. And that's very strange. Because there must yeah. be a million days in between in which nothing at all of any consequence happened. Yeah. 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 It was so hard to get through. And now, yeah, it's, yeah, the, the melancholy, the bittersweet and all that. Yeah, it's, it's yesterday and 20 years ago at the same thing. Yeah. So how many books do you think you've got in you? Oh, jeez. We have, I, we have, uh, yeah. how many do we have at the moment? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Then there's all the New Yorker stuff. I was going to ask, yeah, of course, you, you caught in for the New Yorker, which is weird. Yeah. I didn't know that. Because when I look at what you did there, I don't even recognize your style. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's great. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I changed styles. I, I had to relearn humor. I was doing stuff for The Onion, um, a little single panel comic for them, and and then uh, Matt Diffie, a cartoonist at the New Yorker, was in Portland, and I saw him talk, and and I thought, oh, this is something I, I want to do. And I talked to him, and I asked him, how do I submit? How do I do this? And he, um, and he helped me. You know, like he he said, well, send me your comics. I'll critique them. I'll tell you how it works, and what what sells and what doesn't. What they're looking for. Um, and so that was, that was interesting. Cause that was like, I, I didn't want to be the band kiss where like, I've done one thing I'm and sorry, all of a sudden I'm a huge I'm, kiss fan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> good reference. Well, you know, they're 60 years old and they still, you know, I guess yeah. now he doesn't put on the makeup, but that's the one thing is like, okay, you know, Gene Simmons and the tongue, you know, like that's a, and I didn't want to be that. I wanted yeah. to be somebody that, that was known. 
when people would meet me, they would say, oh, you're too much coffee, man. And it's like, no, like I'm a cartoonist who did this thing. Like, um, and to break out of this, that mold was, was tough. Um, and yeah, it took the New Yorker to kind of do that to some extent, but then to relearn humor and how, what to draw and how to draw it, because they're not going to want for their cartoons. They didn't want underground cartoon style. And I, yeah. I had to go for a minimalism. I, I wanted a minimalism with a, with a stiff line weight uh, rather than expressive line weight and pulling back on the emotions. And I would do cartoons and Diffie would say like, well, this is a, you know, this is a pun base or this humor is kind of slapstick. And those are things, you know, it, the New Yorker wants something that's cultural, something universal, um, no homeless jokes, no fat jokes, no puns. I mean, that's, and you sat and went, what's left? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was tough. It was a yeah. tear down and then rebuilding, you know, um, which was really a good, healthy thing to do a few times in your life, I think. No, totally. Um, did you ever get, did anyone, anyone ever ask you to draw any of the the big guns? I know a lot of comic book artists who are underground sort of wandered off in the, in the, into the Batman world and, and so on. Did you ever get asked? I did. Um, they had one called strange tales at Marvel and I did a captain America story in that. And I had the red skull had been hiding out in South America. Cause you know, the Nazis fled and hide in South America. and he had actually found happiness in South America. Um, with indigenous people like he'd all of a sudden found a home and he'd kind of turned a new leaf um and found peace with himself and with life and nature and you know captain america still pissed off at him and then the the clear cutting um encroaches on the on the land and then so now all of a sudden red skull f has to fight these uh lumberjacks you know the, the lumber company yes. and then Captain America gets winds of this and he fights them. Um, and yeah, then the, the resolution is that, you know, Red Skull's like, hey, kill me. I'm just trying to save the people. And uh, Captain America's like, well, if you want to, you know, for, you're for real, then you need to find a balance and blah, 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 and, you know, work within the system. And then the, the punchline is that um, they do you know, he, he says, okay, if you save my people, then, um, you know, I'll, I'll let you live, you know, uh, Captain America, I'll let you live. And so Captain America saves the people, but he turns it all into a strip mall. Um, was a punch <laughs> all developed, you know? And, and so, yeah, I did that story. I wrote it, I drew it, you know, they, and they ran it, it published. But the funny thing was, is that, um, it was right around the time of the Captain America movie was just about to come out and it wasn't even announced, but my editor was like, at first he was like, you can do anything you want. And then he's like, yeah, I hate to edit you on this, but could you just make Captain America 20% less of an asshole? <laughs> we got this movie coming out. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. You know, like it's not a, that was my one. That's your contribution. Yes, yes. It's not canon, but you know, it's it's yeah. out there. What's your what's your relationship like with with mainstream comics? Did did uh, you probably don't read them now? I don't read very many, but back then I did a lot. Um, Chip Chip Zdarsky, I like his stuff. Ed Brubaker, I like his stuff. Um, I I, I follow people now, so it's like if it's somebody I like and I know they're talented and they're going to do something fun and interesting. Then uh, I try to chase it down. I usually wait for the graphic novels. So I don't have, you know, I can't afford the $6 comic books. It seems yeah, absurd. Yeah. Um, I really like Jeff Lemire at the moment. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's I not mainstream. But yeah. Lemire's and a he sweetheart. seems to have scored um, a winning handshake with Netflix or Amazon, whichever one. Uh, Sweet. Just amazing. 
Yeah, yeah Sweet Tooth was great. Um, yeah, and you know, I used to have jealousy when I was younger too, and I'd be like, "Oh, why isn't that me?" But now I just feel so happy when I see somebody like Jeff Lemire doing well. I just, yeah, it's such a pleasure to see that. But, um, there's there's certainly some unhinged comics out there still. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm I, I, I'm liking Kickstarter. Like that's a weird, interesting distribution method that is getting some weird, interesting comics out. So um I just saw Carrie Gamble's doing a thing with uh a Frankenstein. I think Mignola just did a Pinocchio bit. Um yeah, there's just some weird comics. I'm since I did a Kickstarter myself, all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is a distribution method. Um, and it's creating these weird communities where people are following each other and it's allowing people to self publish in a similar vein as, as what people were doing, you know, 20 years ago with yeah. self publishing. It's, um, it's both good and bad, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Everything is a mix. Just the way it is. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's neat this. to see it. Yeah. Did no. I miss anything? Oh, geez. Uh, no, I think I I usually forget to plug my new crap and what I'm working on. So I think I managed to talk a lot about that. I, I swear, I was like, I'm going to talk about Kickstarter. I swear to God. Yeah, I probably talked too much about it. Um, Have you got a new no, Kickstarter? I, just about to do the new next one, which will be the zines that I did of too much coffee, man. I, um, so the rare, it's like rarities and B sides. Cause I did the one through nine rarities and B sides. Then I'm going to do my dirty comics, uh, which aren't all that dirty, but like I did a story about a guy with a micro penis. Um, a, a true, a, like a little true story with, a, I went to camp and this guy had a micro penis <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's like the level of dirty that I have. And I mean, I'll real quick is it's yeah. I heard laughing coming out of the showers and I went in and, and um, I thought everybody was going to be laughing at him and he was laughing too. Like everybody was, and it was all, <laughs> it was commiserate. They're like, dude, you know, and he, he had an erection. It was just this tiny, tiny little erection. And, and everybody was just like, dude that's it's that's horrible and he's like i know and they're like what are you gonna do he's like there's nothing i can do and they're like man your life's gonna be difficult and he's like yeah i know and they're like we're so sorry like I, I, it blew my mind as like a 13 year old like that there was this much empathy and understanding in a group of young men um yeah that doesn't thought, normally this, happen yeah yeah right um nothing in all the teen movies that I had watched up to that point had prepared me for that moment. So like, that's one of the stories I, I've written and drawn that up. Um, yeah. I just thought if he could deal with that problem with that much grace, then I need to look at my life differently. So when I face problems, I need to try to have that kind of grace in, in my problems because it's nothing's going to match having a micro penis. I mean, like that's, I can't even imagine. Like, <laughs> horror, horror. Um, you need a t-shirt. That's a Kickstarter t-shirt. <laughs> so I'm excited to put that in a book and have the dirty comics in there. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we covered it. That's. Uh... <laughs> but the main thing is, there's plenty of life left in you yet. There's still things coming. Yes. Yes. And people and... just have to look. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and I'd give URLs and all that crap, but man, just Google. I mean, it's so easy. No, I'll it find people... it and stuff it in the show yeah. notes. You've got your, uh, your just... site, the Etsy, st the Etsy store. All that crap. It's all, and it changes every. You know, ugh, God, I hate. Yeah. WW crap. So yeah, just find it. <laughs> Superb. No, it was great. Thank you very, very much. Oh, it was and, my um, pleasure. Maybe we could. To do it again in the future anytime when, anytime when you got something I, you know next week i'll yeah next week which will be a year from now but yeah tomorrow and yesterday it's all this it's 
I'll book it into my magical calendar that says next week and then it'll be 2027. I'm going, okay. I'm in. I'm I'm in totally in. Thanks, (laughs) Jeff. My pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. See you soon.